In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about two bacterial genera, Moraxella and Chlamydia. What's particularly interesting about Chlamydia is that not only is it an intracellular parasite that's undergone this sort of long evolutionary process of genome reduction, but it has a biphasic life cycle with two distinct forms. these two organisms within one lecture today, they're really quite different from each other. Moraxella are all biocontainment level 2, while our chlamydia species vary. Chlamydia pneumoniae, suis, and trachomatis are all biocontainment level 2, while chlamydia cytosci and abortus are biocontainment level 3. Moraxella are gram-negative, strictly aerobic bacteria, well, chlamydia, like I said, are obligate intracellular parasites. They don't actually possess the metabolic machinery to replicate on their own. They need the host cells, so we can only grow them in things like cell culture. They're also really interesting for their biphasic development, which I'll describe here. The infectious stage of chlamydia are elementary bodies. Um, these are small structures which bind to the cell surface and are endocytosed. Once they're endocytosed, they form these inclusion bodies and then differentiate into the more metabolically active reticulocyte bodies. These reticulocyte bodies then divide, they multiply, then differentiate back into elementary bodies. Um, and these then leave the cell either through sort of extrusion, so this whole um, inclusion structure is able to leave, or the cell can be completely ruptured, releasing the contents out into the extracellular space. I've put a link to a video above that shows this uh, microscopically. In this image here, um, you can see a cytological preparation of a conjunctival swab from a cat. Uh, this cell up here, you can see reticulocyte bodies, so these clusters of sort of more basophilic structures. Below that and to the right, uh, indicated by this arrowhead, you can see coccoid-shaped organisms intracellularly within this neutrophil. Here you can see a pure culture of Moraxella bovis. Um, these are gram-negative cocci. And in this highlighted image on the right here, I think you can see that they commonly cluster together as pairs. So they form diplococci. You can see the two organisms closely associated with each other. As far as where they're found, Moraxella are really host-associated. We find them uh, on the mucous membranes of mammals, and they really don't survive well outside the host. In a veterinary context, Moraxella bovis may be transmitted between individuals through mechanical vectors like insects. Chlamydia we really think of as being host-associated, although those elementary bodies are somewhat resistant to environmental conditions and can persist for several days outside the host. The avian gastrointestinal tract is the natural site for chlamydia cytosci. And one thing that's really important to know with all chlamydia is that asymptomatic or subclinical infections are really, really common. And this is a big problem for identifying uh, carriers and potential reservoirs of these organisms within a herd or population of people or animals. We have 21 species of Moraxella, of which Moraxella bovis is our most impactful in veterinary medicine. Within the genus Chlamydia, we have 12 species, and this includes sort of the recent re-agglomeration of several related genera back into Chlamydia. So Chlamydophila used to be considered distinct, um, and it's been re-clustered with Chlamydia. So we no longer have Chlamydophila cytosci, it's Chlamydia cytosci. Moraxella species can be relatively easily uh, differentiated from each other biochemically. Important characteristics include uh, their hemolysis pattern, catalase, and gelatinase. And on this image on the right here, you can see a pure culture of Moraxella bovis on blood agar, and I think the beta hemolysis under and around the colonies is quite evident. Moraxella species produce type 4 pili to grab onto their host tissues, a cytotoxin, and transferrin and lactoferrin binding proteins. Virulence factors in chlamydia are a really important and really large part of their genome. These organisms as intracellular parasites have become so dependent on 
uh, their eukaryotic host, that they've actually lost a lot of their genomes, that process of genome reduction. Um, this has happened to such an extent that actually virulence genes comprise 10% of their genome. They produce various secretion systems, type 2, 3, and 5, um, that allow them to secrete effector molecules and are involved in cellular invasion as well as cytotoxins, which allow them to slow down the cell cycle. The organism really wants to control when the cell dies or ruptures so that it's able to optimize its life cycle. There's a number of important diseases that we associate with these organisms. For Moraxella, uh, Moraxella bovis is really associated with conjunctivitis in cattle. Our chlamydia species cause a diverse uh, set of clinical diseases. Um, chlamydia cytosci in birds we see as a cause of pneumonia, air sacculitis, conjunctivitis, pericarditis, and encephalitis. And in humans, it causes a disease called psittacosis. Chlamydia cytosci is actually a very broad host range pathogen that we can see infecting many veterinary species above and beyond just birds. Chlamydia abortus causes enzootic abortion of ewes and abortion in other ruminant species as well. Chlamydia pneumoniae causes primarily respiratory tract infections, probably the biggest problem in people, but we also see it in horses and koalas. Chlamydia suis is seen as a cause of conjunctivitis, reproductive and intestinal infections in pigs. And then finally, chlamydia trachomatis is a cause of a sexually transmitted infection in people and really has a fairly narrow host range. We'll start with Moraxella bovis. Um, so this is the cause of bovine conjunctivitis, or pink eye. From exposure, we see an incubation period of two days to three weeks. And affected animals have a variety of clinical signs, starting with copious watery lacrimation. So they're tearing a lot. We also see blepharospasm, or sort of uncontrollable blinking and photophobia, or sensitivity to light. We can see the development of corneal edema and opacity in the center of the cornea, which can actually ulcerate. Um, in very severe cases, the eyes can rupture, leading to blindness, although most animals recover. Cattle are the main reservoir of Moraxella bovis, and it's transmitted between individuals through uh, insect vectors. So it's sort of mechanically transmitted. So the fly lands on the eye, consumes some of that uh, uh, fluid, the, the lacrimation, um, and then moves on to the next animal and lands near its eye, bringing the organism with it. In these images here, you can see sort of the progression of conjunctivitis in, in cattle. Um, in this top image here, you can see there's perhaps quite a bit of lacrimation. So you can see tearing has been present in the uh, medial canthus of the eye. We also perhaps have a little bit of corneal edema or this sort of a cloudy gray appearance. Here the lesion is progressing further. Um, we have maybe a bit more reddening, uh, conjunctivitis, and uh, further edema of the cornea. In image three, we have a, a very severe corneal infection. You can see it's very, very reddened. The cornea is almost completely opaque, and we have the development of an ulcer. And then finally, the most severe lesion really is a perforation of the corneal ulcer and actually prolapse of the iris. In this image here, you can see uh, a cytology slide uh, from a bovine eye. So these large epithelial cells here from the cow itself, and then these clusters of coccoid bacteria, indicative of the presence of Moraxella bovis. Treatment of these infections really relies on antimicrobials. Um, we can apply these drugs either topically or potentially parenterally. Adjunctive measures with the goal of protecting animals from light um, are also helpful, so housing them indoors and potentially even giving the cows eye patches to sort of alleviate that photophobia and pain of the eye. Fly control can be really useful. We can prevent further transmission um, to other animals, and we have no vaccines available, so prophylactic measures really are not a possibility in, in this case. Chlamydia cytosci is the cause of psittacosis, the sort of colloquial name of this disease in birds or people or other species. And in birds, what we see is a variety of syndromes. So we can have sort of an upper respiratory plus eye infections, nasal and ocular discharges, conjunctivitis. Um, affected birds can have green yellow feces. They can be um, super inactive. They can have weight loss and become even kind of cachexic. In acute disease, we can have very severe 
uh, both gross and histological lesions. So hepatomegaly, serofibrinous polycerocytis, and petechial hemorrhages on the liver and spleen. Things that we're more likely to see if a bird becomes sick very, very quickly, an acute disease. In this image here, you can see an emaciated parrot um, that has fecal pasting and staining of the tail. And although the colorization of this image is not great, I think you can sort of appreciate that we have sort of a green yellow color um, to that feces. In these images here, you can see uh, hepatic lesions in birds with psittacosis. So on the left, we have necrotizing uh, hepatitis in a military macaw. The liver here is sort of mottled and irregular looking. And then on the right, we have, again, necrotizing hepatitis. It's very mottled, irregular, uh, perhaps congested looking liver, um, along with fibrinous air sacculitis um, and pericarditis. We can also see chlamydia cytosci in gallinaceous birds. So it's not just in our uh, cytosines. It can be in chickens and uh, many other avian species. Transmission of this organism is uh, either fecal, oral, or vertical. The elementary bodies that are shed in the feces are quite resistant to drying and can actually remain infectious for several months in the environment. Treatment of these infections relies on antimicrobials, and unfortunately, we have no vaccines available for chlamydia cytosci. In the United States, this is a reportable disease in people, and in the most recent year where data is available, 2019, eight cases were reported. Um, unfortunately, in Canada, this is not a reportable disease, so we don't have annual incidence data. Um, however, I would anticipate that it would be perhaps proportional population-wise to what's seen in the U.S. In this image on the right here, you can see chlamydia cytosci elementary bodies um, in this squamous cell um, collected from a conjunctival scraping from a cat. So just emphasizing that broad host range. It's not only people and birds, but cats and, and other species can also be infected. Mm -hmm.